Very good. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, uh, we thank you for your Gospels, the four Gospels, which are an eyewitness testimony to the earthly ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. And please bless us now as we begin at the Gospel of Matthew, the first one in the canon. And as we progress through it, please enlighten it and open it to our hearts and minds so that we might grasp more clearly the nature of your Son and our Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Gospel according to Matthew, I'm going to do um, in three sections. Uh, the first section is one to chapters 1 to 9, then 10 to 13, then 14 to 28. And each section will take more than one lecture. Obviously, there's a lot in there. And we'll begin with chapters 1 to 9, obviously. And the course introduction of the, for the overall Gospel, the entire Gospel, not just the first nine chapters, is to understand the structure and purpose of it and to understand the important doctrinal and prophetic aspects of the gospel, and to explain the dispensational and premillennial viewpoint of this study. I'll explain those terms as we go through, and to demonstrate that Ma how Matthew bridges between the Old and the New Testaments. This is the most Jewish of all the gospels, and it is aimed at convincing the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. Now the teaching topics for chapters one through nine are those six there, the genealogy of Jesus, the supernatural incarnation, the ministry of Christ, the calling of the disciples, the requirements of holy living for us, and the authentication of Jesus as Messiah, and the nature and purpose of Jesus healing people. And that's uh, a topic you might want to take notice of because there's an awful lot of uh, wrong practice going on today about healing, the healing ministry. So we will look at that very carefully. So now the introduction and overview of the entire gospel to begin with, now the major focus is the question, why Christ did not bring in his kingdom at his first coming? Which he could have done, but he didn't. Now the important doctrinal and prophetic themes are brought out, as I've said earlier, from a dispensational premillennial viewpoint. Uh, dispensationalism is a view that um, God has um, given different stages of Earth's history, different dispensations, and we're in the dispensation of grace at the moment. And eventually, there'll be a dispensation of the end when Jesus comes back. And the premillennial viewpoint is uh, we believe that Jesus will come back before the thousand year reign, that uh, the book of Revelation says that he will. Um, be in charge of for the thousand years on earth as king based in Jerusalem. So that's quite important. And in fact, Matthew is one of the most important books in the New Testament. And traditionally, it's always been seen as the first book in the New Testament, not uh, second or third, as some modern scholars think. Matthew shows that Jesus fulfills the Old Testament prophecies. It was written before 70 AD probably between AD 45 and 55. And Matthew's purpose is to show that Jesus is the promised Messiah King of Old Testament prophecy. And he gives a progressive account of why Jesus did not bring in the promised kingdom at his first coming. And that's a very important thing to understand, actually. Uh, the Jews rejected him, and God has foreknowledge. He knew they would do that, and that's why Jesus didn't bring it in the first coming because he had to deal with the unbelief and the, and the rejection of the Jewish people. Now he demonstrates the growing, growing rejection of Jesus led to him turning to the Gentiles. And he shows the parables of the kingdom will apply until the end of the age. We won't be doing chapter 13 in this section. We'll be doing that in the next section. Um, but at that time, the true church will be completed at the end of the age referred to as the pearl of great price in the parables of the kingdom in chapter 13 of Matthew. And Israel is referred to as the hidden treasure. As the, in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus describes the course of this age between his advents, with special reference to the great tribulation. And Matthew explains why Christ suffered and died rather than appearing as the conquering king, because the Jews first had forgotten that Jesus the Messiah must first become the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 for the forgiveness of sins, and then he will return as conquering king. But Matthew also gives 
full content of the fundamentals of the Christian faith, producing a church redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And that's important. And I just want to mention something here. Um, when Christ suffered and died, if you remember, they had a choice to either release Jesus or release Barabbas. They could choose Jesus the Christ or Barabbas. Now, what many people don't re remember or haven't known is that the first name of Barabbas, his personal name, was Jesus. His family name was Barabbas. And so you had this Jesus or you had that Jesus. And of course, as we know, the Jewish leadership chose Jesus Barabbas, not Jesus the Messiah. And that is the beginning of our uh, church history, basically, um, when the people involved chose the wrong Jesus. And that's a very important thing for us all to hold on board. You know, which Jesus are, are we choosing uh, to go through life? Well, finally, I want to show you that table about the introduction and overview to the entire gospel. Because you'll see, first of all, there's an introduction. And then at the end, there's a climax and a conclusion. There are the chapter references and a description of what basically they cover. And then there are five narratives and five discourses. Now, a narrative is simply the story of what happened. Jesus went here, he did that, he said this and so on. It's narrative, it's a story. And then the discourse is theological explanation. Jesus sits down and explains what, what, uh, the, what God's plan of redemption is. The first one is the Sermon on the Mount. And the second discourse is uh, the Twelve and their mission. And the third discourse, uh, is tied in with the narrative, is the rejection and revelation. Fourth narrative is about miracles and responses. And the fifth one is the entrance into Jerusalem. And there we get the Olivet Discourse and so on. And uh, then the climax and conclusion are, are narrative. So you see, that's the structure of the gospel. That's the whole structure. And we're going to do the first um, nine chapters in, in this section, which, as you'll see, takes us through the Sermon on the Mount and the miracles of healing and forgiveness, and why the purpose of the healing miracles of Jesus. So there we are. That's, that's what we're going to attempt to do. And um, let us begin by looking at our first lesson, which is the genealogy of Jesus. Now, he has a royal genealogy. That's Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. And, I, and, and by the way, if you have your Bibles open on Matthew chapter 1 at the moment, you'll be able to follow this much better uh, because I'll be referring to various parts of chapter 1 in this lesson. Now, Jesus is portrayed as the true son of David, son of Abraham, son of God, the true Messiah of Israel and the saviour of the world, both of Jew and of Gentile. Now, Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. That's uh, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 16. This is what it reads. Matthew begins with Abraham and ends with Joseph as the husband of Mary, but not the father of Jesus. When the gospel says, of whom was born Jesus, whom is a feminine pronoun referring to Mary. The English language is not very good with masculine and, and uh, feminine pronouns. You cannot tell at a glance who it's referring to. You have to look at the context. But in the original languages, it was very obvious that the pronoun was feminine. Now, in chapter 1, verse 17, there's a threefold genealogy, threefold division, and it's explained like this. Number one, the generations from Abraham to David. Now, Abraham was first in the line of promise, the unconditional Abrahamic covenant, and ends with David as king, the unconditional Davidic covenant, right? So that's the first one. Secondly, the generations from David to Jeconiah. And then there's continuity of the line to Jesus. But there's a problem because Jeconiah was cursed by God and couldn't, couldn't continue the line of kings. Let me explain that. The line through Jeconiah. Now, the purpose of Joseph's genealogy in Matthew is to show that if Jesus was really the son of Joseph, he could not be king. He wasn't actually the real son, was he? Because it was the Holy Spirit acting, uh, Mary who was a virgin, and it gave birth to Jesus. He could not be king if he was really the son of Joseph. And the purpose of the genealogy of Mary in Luke's gospel 
shows why Jesus could claim the throne of David. The purpose of Matthew's genealogy is to demonstrate to the Jews that Jesus was not the son of Joseph. The comparison of the genealogies in Matthew and Luke shows why Jesus could claim the throne of David. Now, Matthew has Joseph's perspective and Luke has Mary's. Joseph is the central active role, but in Luke, it's Mary. An angel appears to Joseph, but in Luke, an angel appears to Mary. And we'll see more about Joseph in a moment. But Jesus is a descendant of David through Mary. And that's the key thing to hold on board. He was, uh, because if the Jews thought that Jesus was the natural son of Joseph, he could not be the Messiah. And, first, and certainly he could not be divine. And that would wreck our faith, wouldn't it? So let's look at this line through Jeconiah in, in more detail. In Matthew, the genealogy traces the line of Joseph, stepfather of Jesus, through Abraham to David and Solomon, and then on to Jeconiah. That's verse 11 of, the, of chapter 1. Now, Jeconiah is also called Yechoniachim. The inclusion of Yechoniah, um, I've been mispronouncing that, I do beg your pardon, it's Yechoniachim, really. That's significant in the light of Jeremiah 22 and verses 24 through 30, which concludes with this uh, comment. No descendant of Jeconiah will sit on the throne of David or rule again in Judah. He shall be childless. God cursed Jeconiah. So that's the end of, of the line. <coughs> it comes to a, an abrupt end when God, God curses the last member of it, Jeconiah. So in Matthew, Joseph was a direct descendant of Jeconiah, and thus Joseph could not inherit David's throne. Excuse me. Matthew then proceeds to show that Jesus was not Joseph's son, but he was born of Mary. And see chapter 1, verse 16, and, and then uh, verses 18 through 25. Now in Matthew, we have recorded that Joseph is the son of Jacob. He could be called the son of Eli, Eli in Luke 3, 23. So how could he be called that, the son of Eli? In Luke, it's not recorded that Eli begat Joseph. So the natural explanation is that Joseph was the son-in-law of Eli, who was a descendant of David. In English, it's translated that Joseph was the son of Eli. However, in the Greek, the words the son are not there. It just says Joseph of Eli. And it's incorrectly supplied by the translators, trying to be helpful as usual. But if you read it in the Greek, the words the son are not there in the whole of that genealogy in, uh, in Luke. Now, in long-standing Jewish tradition, Mary, Miriam, was recognized as the daughter of Eli. The absence of Mary's name is quite in keeping with the Jewish practice on genealogies, where the name of a husband will be substituted. That was the, the Jewish way of doing things in those days. In Luke's genealogy, Jesus is traced back through Nathan as the son of David, and thus Mary was a descendant of the house of David, but not from Solomon, from whom Jack and I descended, but from Nathan. Sorry, those things are out of order there. It should have come through first. Now, Jesus was born of Mary, so he was of the Davidic royal line, totally apart from the curse of Jack and I. One Old Testament requirement for kingship was having the correct Davidic, Davidic line apart from Jeconiah. So we've demonstrated that Jesus fulfilled that first requirement. And that's what Matthew was trying to do uh, for the benefit of the Jews. However, Jesus was not the only member of the line of David through Nathan, apart from Jeconiah. There were others. So what is uh, the second requirement to kingship? And that comes uh, as a divine appointment. There must be a divine appointment to any existing members of the house of David. Now, if you remember, the prophet Samuel went to Jesse's sons and he tested them all. And when he eventually he settled on David, he anointed David. And it's a divine appointment for the prophet Samuel to be king. So there was that divine appointment. And therefore, we need to know that Jesus has the, a divine appointment also. But the angel appeared to Mary and he said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his, of his kingdom, there will be no end. That's Luke's gospel, but it's necessary to look at it here. So in conclusion, then, in the genealogy of Jesus. 
So how could Jesus claim the throne of David? Firstly, he was a member of the royal line and a descendant of David, apart from Jeconiah, came through Nathan, not through Jeconiah, and he came through his mother. And secondly, he received a divine appointment. By the way, this is one of the things you know in uh, Judaism, that if you're a Jew, your, your ancestry is traced back through the, through the mother. That's, that's the, the main thing there. And that is a reflection of that here. So, Christ's right to the third throne of David is clearly established, plus the research into the genealogies of, of Joseph and Mary. They were all taken from uh, Arnold Fruchtenbaum's book entitled Messianic Christology, uh, published by Ariel Menaces in 1998, Appendix 4. Christ's right to David's throne, pages 135 to 139. So that's my source from where I got that. I, it's not the entirely only source, but he's a, he's a substantial one. And Dr. Fruchtenbaum is, in fact, of course, as you'd imagine from the name, uh, a Jew, the Messianic Jew. Now, the mathematical form of the genealogy, many people are worried about this. Matthew's genealogy of Jesus is a summary of Jewish history. It's threefold division into three times 14 family male members was evidently suggested by the name David, which in Hebrew has a numerical value of 14. D is four, V is six, and D is uh, four again. The vowels don't count. And this is in keeping with the rabbinic method of mnemonics or an aid to memory. So they do it three times 14, and that's how they remember the genealogy. And uh, that is explained in Henry Einspruch, uh, Matthew's Gospel, the Lewis and Harriet Lederer Foundation, 1939. So it's um, almost 100 years is that particular piece of uh, research. I'll find it on page two. So that's the genealogy. That's the explanation of the mathematical form of three times 14. His entitlement to the throne of David is both by descent and by divine appointment. And that's the genealogy of Jesus. And that's very important to understand that he is descended from David, legitimately a uh, physical king, but also it's by divine appointment. So therefore he's the divine king. And as we go through the gospel later, we'll talk about his other offices of prophet and priest. But for the moment, we've dealt with his kingship. Let's move on. Now, the incarnation, supernatural conception. Now that's in Matthew chapter one, verses 18 through 25. And if you have your Bibles open, you'll be able to read that and follow it as we go through. Now, Joseph was legally betrothed to Mary as described as husband in verse 16 of chapter one. And Mary's pregnancy was a result of the Holy Spirit's creativity. And this fact was revealed to Joseph. And that also that Mary's son shall be called Jesus. Now Matthew uh, actually quotes Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, to support the doctrine of the virgin birth. And if you remember the quotation yourself, it's very famous. We normally have it at Christmas. The Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which, as you know, means God with us. Now, part of the incarnation is the worship of the Magi, the wise men who turned up. Now, that's in Matthew, starting at chapter 2, so you might want to turn your Bibles to that. Now, these men were students of astronomy and scriptures, and they came to Jesus considerably later after his birth, probably uh, between one and two years after his birth. And they inquired where the king of the Jews would be born. There was widespread expectation of a coming great ruler, even as far away as Babylon from where the Magi came. So these men came bearing kingly gifts. And before I move on, I just want to explain a bit about what I said <clears throat> about them coming about one or two years after Jesus' birth. In, in my book, The Real Star of Bethlehem, I actually explained that the pastiche that we have when we do a nativity scene for Christmas, where we have the animals, the shepherds, the three wise men, you know, the baby in a crib and all the rest of it, and the star above. It's all very nice and it, and it brings together all the different aspects of the incarnation and uh, what Jesus was just after his birth. He was an infant, a newborn infant. But when the star came out to announce to the shepherds that they should go and see the new Messiah, that star was seen in Babylon by the three Magi. Now they had to come from the east and that's a long journey. And they would have had to put together a, a camel train plus servants plus uh, guards 
uh, taking money with them and food and water. It would have taken a long time to organize that. And then the journey itself would have been several months. So you're talking at least a year after Jesus was born. And by then, all the crowding in, uh, in Bethlehem would have gone because the feast would be over. And uh, Jesus would now be living probably with some of his uh, relatives, uh, Joseph's relatives, which was the usual practice in those days. So they would then come to a place which was not a stable, but a house. So the expectation of them coming, if you remember, you go to uh, Jerusalem first and then south to Bethlehem. We'll explain more as that as we go along. Now Herod was informed of what he saw as a threat to his position. When the Magi came to Jerusalem where the star led them, it, it doesn't say that anybody else could see the star. And it must have gone out or something, because when they left Bethlehem going south, it reappeared. So it's a supernatural star. It's not a natural, uh, what is it, a natural uh, phenomenon. It just can't be. Now, when Harry was informed, when the Magi came to him, uh, he saw there's a threat to his position. And here is the prophecy from Micah, verse five, chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, where you are little among the thousands of Judah, and out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. And that, as, uh, as you know, Herod was um, a psychopath, really. Um, he expected uh, to be assassinated at any moment. In fact, he did, in fact, execute some of his own sons because he was jealous of his position. Terribly evil man. But anyway... This Messiah would be a ruling king, and that's why Herod was so anxious. And the wise men were guided by the star, to their amazement, to Bethlehem. And the star had come from the east to guide them, even to the house in Bethlehem. That was very supernatural. Now, not that Jesus was now found in a house, not a cave where he'd been born. And the wise men worshipped Jesus and gave significant gifts as important types, prophetically. Frankincense was presented to Jesus, representing his fragrance of life and his intercession, prayer and priesthood. We've already established kinship. Frankincense from the Magi was an acceptance of his prayer, of his, um, his priesthood. Myrrh was presented to Jesus, representing his suffering, sacrifice and death. Myrrh was with the uh, one of the um, herbs which were then embalm the bodies in at death because in the Middle East, you know, the temperature is quite high and the embalming of the dead was partly to prevent the smell of uh, decomposition. But anyway, myrrh is uh, an incense. It's presented to Jesus about his suffering. And gold, frankincense, myrrh and gold, was presented to Jesus representing his true eternal deity, gold representing eternity because it, it, cannot, it doesn't react with other elements. Gold doesn't rust like iron does. It actually remains the same. So it's eternal. And that was the representation of it. So those are the prophetic gifts that the three wise men gave to Jesus, representing his priesthood, his death and suffering, and his eternal nature as king, or as, you know, as deity. Now in verses 12 to 15 of chapter 2, God spoke to the Magi and to Joseph, through an angel in warnings. Herod had planned to murder Jesus. Now Herod was dead within three years from saying that, from his wicked plan. And the Magi returned to their own country by a different direction, not informing Herod of the whereabouts of King Jesus. They were warned in a dream. God spoke to Joseph and, and also to the Magi. And what did he say to Joseph? Go to Egypt. And so he took Mary and Jesus into Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. So for three years, Jesus and Mary and Joseph were in Egypt. And Joseph then returned to Israel, fulfilling Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, recorded in Matthew 2, verse 15, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by the, the Lord through the prophet, saying, out of Egypt, I called my son. Now, the massacre of the children, this terrible crime in Bethlehem, planned by Herod the Great, and, and uh, executed by Herod the Great, I should say, was intended to make sure that King Jesus did not live to grow up to become the prostitute king of the Jews. 
excuse me, no doubt this was influenced by Satan. I can only think of it, right? Because how can you be so paranoid as to think that? But nevertheless, if you're a Jew and you're quoting Old Testament scriptures about the king would come and here are the magi who follow the scriptures, it should stop you in your tracks, but in, not with Herod. But what he didn't realize was this terrible crime fulfilled a prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 15 to 16, and I'll, I'll, I'll read that out. Thus says the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Thus says the Lord, refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. That was a prophecy for then. It's a prophecy for now as well, because Israel is back in the land, as you see. But nevertheless, even today, we're still weeping. We're still weeping in Ramah because of all the atrocities committed by um, uh, Ham uh, Hamas and Hezbollah. And now there's a great war because Israel retaliated. But nevertheless, a voice was heard in Ramah. So King Herod fulfilled that prophecy then. And there's a lot going on now which could be related, but we shall have to wait for it to unfold before we make a proper decision. And verse 17 continues, there is hope in your future, says the Lord, that your children shall come back to their own border. And there we are. They have come back to their own border. And it's interesting to note that Rachel was buried in Bethlehem and many women still wept at her tomb at the time of Jesus. Now they return to Nazareth, Nazareth's in uh, Aramaic, Nazareth's. Joseph took Mary and Jesus to Nazareth in English, or Nazareth's, after the death of Herod, fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah 11, verse 1. And also, there shall become a forth, come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Now, Christ was declared to be a rod or a branch. Hebrew, Netzer, is a branch. Uh, Nazareth's is a variation of that from the stem of, stem of Jesse, which would be David. Uh, David was the first son of Jesse, and Christ was declared to be a branch. So there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Very interesting. There's a fulfillment of prophecy there. Isaiah 12, 2 affirms this. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, and the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. The source of his authority and power would be the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit upon him, namely rest, wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord, his Father in heaven. Now these incidents are highlighted by Matthew to give a significant support to the conclusive evidence that Jesus is the Messiah, son of David, or descendant of David, King of the Jews, Son of God. And I want to stop there. That's Matthew chapters 1 to 9. And uh, what we'll do is next time when we come back, we'll go into the ministry of Christ and what that means and the calling of the disciples. But we've done the genealogy, we've done the introduction, and we've done the supernatural incarnation. So um, just going back to the end of that, There we are. It is, in fact, the source of Jesus' authority will be the ministry of the Holy Spirit upon him. And again, referring back to the last lecture about the Trinity, there is the Trinity in action yet again. The incarnation of the second person of the Trinity. The third person is uh, the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit with Jesus and the Father still in heaven. So there is another explanation of the Jesus, of, of the Trinity, sorry, in the uh, narrative of the incarnation and the genealogy of Jesus. So that is Matthew's introduction to the Jews of the uh, incarnation and the supernatural incarnation and the um, eligibility of Jesus to be the king, which uh, through, through Mary from Nathan, son of David, so there we are. That's the end of that. Um, I hope you've found that 
interesting, and I hope it's set you up for next week when I'll be doing the ministry of Christ on earth. So uh, just like to pray to conclude this evening. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and we thank you for your gospels especially, each of which gives uh, four different aspects of the ministry of our Lord on earth. Thank you for all of your scripture, but especially the eyewitness testimony of the gospels and those who were there and closest to Jesus, writing down what they know, what they knew, and what they saw and what they heard for our benefit 2,000 years later. So please renew our strength of faith in you, Lord. Renew our uh, determination to uphold the gospel and to uphold the ministry of Jesus and the Holy Spirit whilst uh, we are still here on earth, but our Lord and Saviour is in heaven. Come back soon, Jesus. Come back soon, O oh Lord. We are waiting eagerly for your return. And please bless us and strengthen us and guide us whilst we wait. In the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.